In the early years of the 20th century, no one would have believed that humans were being watched by more advanced yet mortal beings. People going about their daily lives are being studied, much like they observe microbes. From the depths of space, highly developed, cold, and merciless minds contemplate plans to conquer the Blue Planet. A young couple, John and Amy, along with their acquaintance, astronomer Ogilvy, spend their time observing Mars. The scientist draws their attention to a strange column of smoke that he cannot explain. Then he gives the couple a photo he took, suggesting that a volcano might be erupting on Mars. The man is very hospitable, although the couple are outcasts in society. Amy is delighted that at least one person treats them well, for their love is the reason for their ostracism. In the morning, George goes to work at the publishing house, where everyone discusses the news of several fishing boats being sunk, seemingly by Russian ships moving towards Japan. George is sent to the Admiralty, where his brother serves, hoping to get fresh information for an article, while Amy chooses wallpaper for the nursery. The shopkeeper, upon learning who she is, still agrees to make the delivery, which Amy takes as a good sign. Upon arriving at the Admiralty, George listens to the British War Minister's tirade about the superiority of the Anglo-Saxon race, then meets his brother, who is very hostile. George invites Frederick over, but he leaves without saying goodbye. Later, he suggests to his wife that she should go to college, as she is very smart, and confesses that his brother has not changed his opinion about their actions. He regrets dragging her into this adventure, but Amy reminds him that she chose it herself. As long as they are together, they can overcome anything. At this moment, a distant rumble is heard outside. Frightened people run into the street where they see strange clouds. Ogilvy finds a fallen meteorite. In the morning, the trio goes to the site. A huge round object lies in the middle of the forest. George suggests it's a giant projectile, but then what kind of cannon could have fired it? Amy proposes sending a message to the newspaper, but the telegraphs aren't working. She insists George take a photo and go to the newspaper himself. The material will surely be published. He leaves, and Amy and Ogilvy begin examining the object. George tells his editor about the incident, but he refuses to print it. His brother has categorically forbidden giving him work. Amy explains to Ogilvy that George, at his family's insistence, was married to his cousin. They hated each other and were not happy. When Amy and George met, they fell in love and began living together, although they cannot formalize their relationship. At that moment, the sphere suddenly cracks. Ogilvy doesn't have time to examine the details as the royal astronomer arrives, photographing the entire group first. George visits his ex-wife, asking her to sign the divorce papers. She resolutely refuses the traitor. Meanwhile, the excavation continues and the meteorite suddenly begins to move and make ticking sounds. Excited people crowd around as George arrives. The astronomer approaches the object, which sheds its shell. The sphere rises into the air while the astronomer bursts into bright flames. People try to extinguish him, but it's futile. Panic ensues, the crowd disperses. George grabs Amy and the sphere disintegrates into tiny pieces. The couple returns to the panicking town as another meteorite falls nearby. In the morning, George goes to the wasteland to find Ogilvy, but the area is cordoned off by the military, who believe there was just a fire. Amy looks for her friend at his house, but finds only photographs of strange objects. A crater begins to form at the second meteorite's impact site. George's brother learns that he didn't go to work and is somewhere near the incident. Terrifying events begin to unfold in the town. Something approaches, destroying everything and killing people. George catches a horse and, seating Amy on it, tries to leave the town when a giant Martian tripod rises over a building, making eerie sounds. He orders Amy to ride to London to his brother while he stays on the rubble-filled street. He doesn't know that something similar is happening in the south of the country. Dozens of bodies float down the river. The government is in panic. Telegraphs are not working, and no one knows what is happening in the world. Amy finds Frederick, but he also knows nothing about his brother's fate, who at this time is getting out from under the debris and heading out of town. Amy tells her brother-in-law about her experiences in the town, and he accuses her of leaving his brother in danger. The woman confesses that she is expecting a child. The action shifts to the future, where Amy, with her now-grown son, wanders the devastated country in search of her husband. Over the ruined cities, desiccating winds blow and lightning flashes. The woman receives a small portion of food. The seller encourages her to hope for the best. She buys her son a book about the great victory. Meanwhile, George gets out from under the rubble and goes to his house, where, after writing a note for Amy, he ponders his next steps when he hears sounds in the garden and meets a young soldier who survived from an entire regiment. They decide to go to London, but along the way hear a child's cry. George intends to find him, but then the pair sees a huge tripod. The men hide, the Martian passes by, and the child falls silent. 
At this time, George's brother brings Amy to the minister, where she shows photos of Mars. The men are very skeptical of them, as the speed of arrival is simply staggering, but the events speak for themselves. George and the soldier find a sergeant gathering volunteers. Many soldiers have already died, and now he hopes to shoot the not-yet-open sphere with cannons. George refuses to join the army. He needs to find Amy, but the sergeant holds him at gunpoint, and George becomes a soldier. The future. Amy's son reads a book about the victory over the Martians and asks about his father's fate. The woman assures him that he was very brave and also fought against the invaders. In the past, the sergeant's small squad finds the sphere in the forest and prepares the gun. George tries to stop them. It's useless, but the sergeant is determined. The soldiers fire, but the sphere rises into the air, then disintegrates into thousands of tiny pieces. People celebrate the victory and go to inspect the crash site, but at the next moment, a Martian tripod rises above them. While in London, the minister tries to convince the crowd that the British troops are the bravest and the guns are the best. The alien fires on the military detachment. The fleeing George sees Martian tripods behind him and realizes that there are already many of them on Earth. Amy sits on the steps of the Admiralty when a Martian tripod appears from behind the building. People run as he sprays them with deadly black smoke. Frederick, Amy, and the minister run into an alley and barely manage to close the doors. The politician is excited, dreaming of capturing the alien weapon. Then Britain could conquer the whole world. But suddenly the man feels ill. He was the last to run and managed to inhale the smoke. Black liquid begins to flow from his mouth and Amy and Frederick escape. Meanwhile, George reaches the outskirts of London, where refugees tell him that most have headed to the coast. Frederick and Amy go there too. The future. Amy learns that there is a man from her town on the church list and waits for his arrival with hope. In the past, George reaches the beach filled with refugees. Amy searches for her husband among the people, while Frederick tries to organize the evacuation. He orders Amy to get into a boat, though she doesn't want to leave, and then George finds his brother. He calls out to Amy, and hearing his voice, she jumps out of the boat, which the Martian immediately sinks. The woman saves a girl and swims towards her husband. The people see a shot from a ship sever the Martian's leg, and he dies. People on the shore rejoice. George and Amy get ashore, and with the rescued girl and Frederick, start running as another alien falls behind them. All this Amy remembers while waiting for the arrival of her fellow townsman, who turns out to be Ogilvy. He tells her he was very ill for a long time, then conducted experiments on captured weapons. She tells him that she lost George a long time ago and hasn't seen him since. Ogilvy is skeptical about humanity's victory. After all, the aliens achieved their goal. They scouted the paths, landed, and seeded Earth with red weeds that kill all living things. What if that was their plan, to turn Earth into a second Mars? The events return to the day the refugees reach the outskirts. George and Amy share their experiences when the sound of a tripod is heard outside. Everyone hides under the table as the Martian falls near the house. People go to see what happened. A bleak future. People try to sow grain, but the red plants stifle it. Preachers call for prayer, and Ogilvy continues to study the Martian legacy. The scientist tells them that he survived by jumping into the river and then hiding in the sewer for a long time. When he came to his senses, the victory had already been won and Amy remembers how they hid in that house and dawn never came. People realized it was the smoke hiding the earth from the light. George feels unwell, so Frederick and Amy go looking for food and water together. They inspect the house and find human bodies in the inner courtyard, apparently dumped here by the Martians. Returning to the common room, they hear the sounds of tripods and hide under the tables. Everyone except the exhausted elderly lady, and then a creature penetrates the door, sucking blood from the woman and dragging her body away. Apparently, it is the Martian. In the future, little George falls ill, and Ogilvy promises to come up with something. He constantly observes Mars, waiting for opposition, and Amy asks questions about God, and again the past. Frederick recalls Britain's past victories. Their soldiers have been in worse situations than this. He suggests making homemade grenades from lamp oil. He is full of enthusiasm, which George extinguishes. After all, Britain has been doing the same thing to other nations for many years. What if this is punishment? When people from the jungles saw the white man, didn't they hope to find friendship, but receive bullets and death? England goes through countries, capturing lands, destroying undeveloped tribes. But Frederick disagrees with his beliefs. He yells at his brother when George feels unwell. Amy calls to leave the house. In the future, little George gets worse. Amy asks the scientist to grow typhoid cells to make a vaccine, which puzzles Ogilvy. In the past, the trio goes into the courtyard where the Martian roams. It seems he is ill or injured. They hope to leave unnoticed, but another monster penetrates inside and grabs the girl. Nevertheless, the others manage to run into the courtyard. 
Frederick throws a homemade grenade at the Martian. It catches fire, but in its last effort, attacks the man. Amy and George hide in the basement, where the man's condition worsens. And then she realizes that the Martians crawled out of the machines to eat people, which killed them. And now in the future, she suggests Ogilvy vaccinate the survivors. But the priest objects. So the scientist does everything in secret. He collects materials from the bodies of the dead and prepares a typhoid vaccine. Amy remembers how, after everything that happened, George lost his mind. He dreams of negotiating with the Martian, believing that Amy despises him. The woman asks him to wait until the Martian in the courtyard dies, and then they can leave. In the future, Ogilvy wakes Amy. He managed to make a vaccine, but more importantly, this vaccine kills the red mold. They can clear the land and sow seeds. Little George feels better, but the priest doesn't believe in all this ungodly doctrine. It cannot be that some bacteria killed the invaders. Ogilvy reminds him that earthly organisms adapted to earthly diseases, paying for it with millions of lives. In the past, Amy feels unwell, and George again brings up the idea that it is possible to negotiate with the Martians. His wife tries to reason with him, but he goes into the yard. Amy runs after him and sees a Martian appear from around the corner. George distracts him, giving Amy a chance to run and dies. Now Amy remembers that she left him and therefore survived. Ogilvy convinces her that she did everything right for she was saving the child. But the woman doesn't understand what good can await little George in the future and the scientist proves that life is a value. Then she reached their former home and found the note George left for her. Here her son asks his mother to tell him what is on this planet and the woman begins to tell about distant India where she grew up, about the sun, blue sky, mountains, and animals. And then she sailed here. And although it was always rainy here, she loved this land where there were many children. George asks his mother to go where all this remains. Amy promises that it will all be and heads to the land she and Ogilvy decontaminated where the first shoots appear and the clouds disperse, revealing the first rays of the sun. The show ends here.